The K by Theodore Taylor, Chapter 19. It was about noon when I heard the bell. It sounded like bells I'd heard in St. Anna Bay and in the Shadagat. Small, engi- small boats and tugs used them to tell the engineer to go slow or fast or put the engines in reverse. For a moment I thought I was dreaming. Then I heard the bell again, and with it the slow chugging of an engine. And voices! They were coming from East Beach. I ran down there. Yes, a small boat had come into Devil's Mouth and was approaching our quay. I yelled, I'm here, I'm here. There was a shout from across the water, a man's voice. We see you. I stood there on East Beach, stew cat by my feet, looking into the direction of the sounds. I heard the bell again, then the engine went into reverse, the propeller thrashing. Someone yelled, jump, Scotty, the water's shallow. The voice was American, I was certain. The engine was now idling and someone was coming toward me. I could hear him padding across the sand. I said, hello. There was no answer from the man, I suppose. He was just staring at me. Then he yelled to someone on the boat, My lord, it's a naked boy and a cat. The person on the boat yelled, Anyone else? I called out, No, it's just us. I began to move towards the man on the beach. He gasped, Are you blind? I said, Yes, sir. In a funny voice, he asked, Are you all right? I'm fine now. You're here, I said. He said, Here, boy, I'll help you. I said, if, you, if you'll carry Stew Cat, you can just lead me to the boat. After I had climbed aboard, I remembered Timothy's knife stuck in, t- in the palm tree. It was the only thing I wanted off the quay. The sailor who carried Stew Cat up went up the hill to get it while the other sailor asked me questions. When the first sailor came back from the hill, he said, you wouldn't believe what's up there. I guess he was talking about our hut and the rain catchment. He should have seen the ones Timothy built. I don't remember everything that happened in the next few hours, but very soon I was helping, helped up the gangway of a destroyer. On the deck, I was asked so many questions all at once that one man barked, Stop badgering him! Give him food, medical care, and get him into a bunk! A voice answered meekly, Yes, sir, Captain. Down in sickbay, the captain said, What's your name, son? Philip Enright. My father lives in Willemstad. He works for Royal Dutch Shell, I answered. The captain told someone to get a priority radio message off to the naval command at Willemstad and then asked, How did you get on that island? Timothy and I drifted to it after the Hato was sunk. Where's Timothy at? he asked. I told the captain about Timothy and what happened to us. I'm not sure the captain believed any of it because he said quietly, Son, get some sleep. The Hato was sunk way back in April. I said, Yes, sir, that's right. And the doctor came to check me over. That night, after the ship had been in communication with Willemstad, the captain visited me again to tell me that his destroyer had been hunting a German submarine when the plane had spotted my black smoke and radioed back to the ship. There was still disbelief in his voice when he said he'd checked all the charts and publications on our bridge. Our quay was so small that the charts didn't even dignify it with a name. But Timothy had been right. It was tucked back up in the devil's mouth. The next morning, we docked at the naval base in Cristobal, Panama, and I was rushed to the hospital. Though I really didn't think it was necessary. I was strong and healthy, the doctor on the destroyer had said. My mother and father flew over from Wilmstad in a special plane. It was minutes before they could say anything. They just held me, and I knew my mother was crying. She kept saying, Philip, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. The Navy had notified them that I was blind, so it would not be a shock. I knew that that I looked different. They brought a barber in to cut my hair, which had grown quite long. We talked for a long time, Stu Cat on my bed, and I tried to tell them all about Timothy and the K, but it was very difficult. They listened, of course, but I had the feeling that neither of them really understood what had happened on our K. Four months later, in a hospital in New York, after many x-rays and tests, I had the first of three operations. The piece of timber that had hit me that night on the Hato went down had damaged some nerves, but after the third operation, when the bandages came off, I could see again. I would always have to wear glasses, but I could see. That was the important thing. In early April, I returned to Willemstad with my mother, and we took up life where I'd been left off the previous April. After I'd been officially reported lost at sea, she'd gone back to Curaçao to be with my father. She'd changed in many ways. She had no thoughts of leaving the islands now. I saw Henrik van Boven occasionally, but it wasn't the same as when we played the Dutch or the British. He seemed very young, so I spent a lot of time along St. Anna Bay and at the Reuterkata market talking to the black people. I liked the sound of their voices. Some of them had known Timothy from Charlotte Amalie. I felt close to them. At War's End, we moved away from Charlou and Carrasso. My father's work was finished. Since then, I've spent many hours looking at the charts of the Caribbean. I found Roncador, Rosalind, 
Quinto Sueño and the Serenilla Banks. I found Beacon K and North K in the islands of Providencia and San Andres. I've also found the Devil's Mouth. Someday I'll charter a schooner out of Panama and explore the Devil's Mouth. I hope to find the lonely little island where Timothy is buried. Maybe I won't know it by sight, but when I go ashore and close my eyes, I'll know this was our own K. I'll walk along the east beach and out to the reef. I'll go up to the hill to the row of palm trees and stand by his grave. I'll say, Dis be dat outrageous K, eh, Timothy?